All right, uh, we're in Philippians chapter, well, all over Philippians, but Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, to start with uh, Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. Um, Philippians 1, 29. So Paul says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Read that again. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Uh, so we could call this something like beyond belief, beyond belief. Uh, so the question would be, is mere belief in Jesus enough to live the Christian life effectively? And so we're looking at this verse, and then we're going to trail down uh, into chapter 2 and get this main section uh, between this week and next week, be, between um, uh, Jesus' passion, his um, sacrifice on the cross, and his exaltation, which followed that, of course, uh, at the right hand of the Father. Um, so is, is mere belief. So obviously Paul is saying not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, literally, uh, Paul would say this, not only, not only this, um, toward him to believe. Now, he orders it this way in the original, uh, toward him. And I'm sort of translating the preposition that way, uh, to him or in his direction, which is kind of a figurative way of saying uh, to look to him in belief, but also, then again, on behalf of him to suffer to suffer on behalf of him. So two infinitives, uh, these are purpose clauses, basically, and they're like banks of a stream. To say, what, what bounds the Christian life? What are two uh, essential things that bound the Christian life uh, to determine how the Christian life is to be lived? And so there are kind of two contexts, or two spheres, or what we call two, two banks that kind of bound us in as Christians. So Paul is telling the believers in Philippi, uh, the first is reliance upon Jesus, and that's rather, rather obvious, uh, but we could take that apart as well as not being so obvious. And the second would be a resolve or a readiness to suffer, uh, but that suffering is not just general suffering like life and its typical hardships, uh, disappointments, things of that nature, but Paul predicates that. In other words, he puts something else first. He says, uh, on behalf of him, or literally... Uh, in, in his place, it's a little, it's a little uh, different way of understanding on behalf of because we would say, well, I guess it's because we wear the label of Christian, you know, so then we're associated with him and thereby we suffer. But Paul, using this, you know, sort of specific preposition, is basically saying uh, you, you suffer as he would or you suffer in his place. Um, to, to give a better sense of this, you go to like you know, a few, few pages over to Colossians 1.24, um, and he says, now, Paul says, same, same author, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. So that, that gets us a little, bit, a little bit closer, but I think staying within Philippians itself, if you go to Philippians chapter 3, and verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and what? Participation in his sufferings. And so what Paul's saying here early on, for it's granted unto you, uh, believers, not only to believe on him or toward him, to look to him trustingly, but also to suffer, but to suffer on his behalf or in in his behalf. Uh, so we're not going to share in the cross. That's specifically his, you know, his cross. Uh, but yet there are other sufferings that Jesus would suffer simply for being who he is that now fall unto us uh, as, as believers. And then I would suggest even uh, as it occurs to me that just to take apart belief a little bit, um, you know, not only to believe in, on him, and that's pretty substantial, or the, the preposition is similar to what John uses in John chapter 1, to believe 
t toward him, to look trustingly toward him. You know, because it's one thing uh, to say, well, yes, I believe God saves. I believe that God forgives. I believe that God this, this, or this, or this. Um, and to have sort of a general sense of belief that God in general does this or God in general is this. But it's another thing to personalize that and to say, I believe that I am one who is in need of forgiveness, me for what I have done, me for the sins that I have committed against God. And so that, that I think is, is packed in here to this personal responsibility and then personal suffering, and this is for, for all of us. So the verb uh, for suffer here refers to the affective nature of experienced affliction, and that sounds you know, kind of highbrow talk, but just so we distinguish this, we can think of the cross, we can think of Jesus, um, his physical suffering on that cross, but I would suggest to you, and I, 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 I just, I, I can't, prove this in any way. But I think the emotional anguish, the mental anguish far exceeded the physical. Uh, we could illustrate that, uh, I think, effectively. But what, what the verb here uh, takes into account is not just that there is some type of physical pain, like somebody beat you or physically harmed you or something like that. This verb really refers to the um, affective side of things, the emotional and uh, the, the mental anguish. And, and when you think about this, um, and there's, there's studies, studies on this, but I haven't done a deep dive into it, and enough to know that parts of the brain that uh, allow us to sense physical pain are the very same parts of the brain that are heightened and sensitized during times of emotional uh, distress and times of mental anguish. It just affects us the very same way, although the sensation is different, but the effect on the body is, is the same. Uh, if you look at uh, the 22nd Psalm, and you'll have uh, the psalmist that is David give, giving basically a, what, what Jesus quotes. So, so Jesus is going to uh, hang on that cross and he is going to identify with the psalmist who says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so far from, as, as he will um, go on to uh, detail, you know, incredible detail, the effect on the physical body that uh, the psalmist was experiencing, that Jesus associates with this, and even the psalmist perhaps speaking prophetically of Jesus um, dying on the cross, but it's at first, my God, my God, why have you uh, forsaken me? And from the lips of Jesus in Matthew, uh, Matthew's uh, gospel and chapter uh, 27 and verse 40, 46, you know, to look at that, um, Jesus cries out, it says, uh, three in the afternoon, he cries out in a, a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you can think of all things he could be doing on that cross, writhing in pain from uh, nails that are, that are placed right, right where the nerve sensitivities are in his wrists and in his, in his feet. But instead, his point of anguish is that of, of mental anguish and crying out to God. Why? Because that affliction is not in the sense of uh, physical pain, although it, it was, Cer certainly there was, but I, I'm just saying that the verb takes in so much more than that because we tend to think of being afflicted as being something that someone does to our body or we feel physical pain. But I, I, I'm saying where, where I could go with this uh, quite, quite a ways is the notion of isolation, pure isolation. And Jesus hung there absolutely and wholly alone. Sure, there, was, there were the malefactors on either side. There were the, the disciples scattered about. There, there were the soldiers. There were all these people around. But he hung on that cross absolutely and completely alone. We'll see in a moment. It was his cross, yes. But, but this sense of aloneness, if you've ever experienced that sense of isolation and, alone, and aloneness, in a very intense way, even though there's a crowd all around you, even though there's people all around you, 
And this is what Jesus experienced, but in a much greater way. Uh, This is someone who, when you say, why have you forsaken me, is one of the most difficult things theologically to understand. Of course, how do you explain that? Someone who is, is, is connected with the, with the Father, with the Spirit in this, in this um, communal way. You know, how, how does one like that experience? But, but when he did, um, it was something of, of mental anguish. And complete, I think that, that just so much transcended any of the, the physical torment and suffering that he was in. Um, so as much as you would look then, take it one step further, uh, because he's experiencing separation from God as much as we can somehow try to wrap our, our minds around. How, how, does, how does Jesus experience separation? How does the Son of God experience this? But yet he does. Um, what is that ultimate separation from, from God? So when you, you think about hell and how hell is described in the Bible, uh, and, and you think, well, well it's got to be the fire. It's got to be the fire that's the scary stuff. It's got to be the, the, the whatever. <clears throat> but you're certainly not going to be there with all your friends and all that, you know. What, what is one of the, I think, the most frightening kinds of um, descriptions or more, most graphic, frightening, yes, descriptions of hell is you're alone. You're utterly and absolutely alone, but not in a temporary capacity, but Forever, for all time and eternity, alone, isolation. But what do they do with um, inmates that misbehave? They put them in what? They put them in isolation. And it's not so they have a little time out, because it's, 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 the, it's probably the cruelest form of punishment, <laughs> the most effective, I could say, uh, if we don't want to say cruel, but the most effective is just isolate. If you want to punish you isolate. You, you just put off to the side. So we, we get a sense then of, of Jesus' suffering, yes, but also for it is granted to you on behalf of Christ. That is, on, on his behalf, not only to believe on him, but also to, to suffer for him. And so we should expect this kind of of suffering, this, this kind of alienation, uh, it, especially in this world, alienation from the world if we're living as those who are resting our complete faith and trust in Jesus. Now, this reference to, uh, to this verb, um, uh, it, it refers then to the cross also, which we'll find um, you know, later on, like verse 8, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. So he is our, our paschal lamb, which comes from pasco, you know, the verb, uh, to suffer. And he's the paschal lamb. And it's, it's illustrative if we look in the Old Testament. Um, it's this lamb that was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement. Uh, but it also, and more specifically, refers to the agony of one who... Um, uh, would be the, the victim of, of hanging on, on a cross, experiencing all of this humiliation, uh, being a public spectacle. spectacle. Um, this progression of, of mental anguish that uh, one is conscious that life is gradually just ebbing away. So Jesus, not technically a victim, of course, because everything that was uh, uh, consistent with the cross, was consistent with the will of the Father that he wasn't forced to obey, but yet he chose and willingly uh, surrendered his life to on our behalf. So in the greater context of this, of this particular verse, uh, Philippians 1.29, we have features of Jesus' uh, magnanimous act for fallen sinful uh, uh, humanity, Uh, Number one, we have the lamb upon his cross. Uh, You see this beginning in chapter two, especially in chapter two and verse five and following. It depicts um, what Jesus did on his cross in relation to suffering. And then we'll see one other uh, quality associated with that, which I think is the most important key to understanding it. But John chapter 19 and verse uh, 17 says, 
John, John says, well, beginning of the second half of verse 16, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the, of the skull. So you, you want to you wanna note that. Uh, this is the lamb, not just upon a cross, any, any old cross, but this was his. And John goes, is probably the only one that goes to this point of, of referencing that. But then we also have the lamb upon his throne. You have both of these in chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, uh, especially when you pick up the reading at uh, verse 9 of chapter 2. Therefore, because of his death on the cross, because of his humbling himself to uh, obedience, to the point of obedience to death, even death on the cross, then, then look, therefore, and now the scene shifts. So on two sides, you have um, his cross and then his throne. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, and so we have this, this rather thematic depiction of the enthroned Jesus in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2 um, and, uh, and verse 33, uh, for example, uh, you know, there's multitudes of these passages, but exalted, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured out explaining Pentecost, but this is exalted to the right hand of God, um, Hebrews uh, chapter 12 and verse 2, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, uh, consider him, so on and so on. Revelation chapter uh, 7 and verse 9, John says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count in every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. If you look back at uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7 in conjunction with Revelation chapter 1, Daniel chapter 7 and uh, verse 9, and this, this whole uh, description of the Ancient of Days, as I looked, thrones, thrones, plural, were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat down to verse 14, then there's a, a description of his appearance. Uh, down to verse 14, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is that which will never be destroyed. And you look back at uh, Revelation chapter 1, for example, and uh, verses 12 through 16, I turned around to see the voice of the one who was speaking to me, and this parallels Daniel chapter 7 in description. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. Son of Man is, is Daniel 7, um, uh, language for the Ancient of, of Days, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and a golden sash around his chest, his hair, and he goes on to, to describe um, his appearance in this, in this context. You go from there in Revelation to chapters 4 and 5, you get two more depictions of the th this chapter. One is the throne room of God, chapter 4, the throne room of God, chapter 5, the, the throne room of God. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, 10 and uh, verse, verse 12, um, but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So we get the sense of uh, this is when you see this terminology of sitting down or sat down or, or his sitting, this is, this is a language of a royal session. Someone is in session. Well, we don't use that term very much anymore. Um, it's not that... Um, he doesn't step off that, you know, at, at any time. For example, he's, he's uh, risen, glorified, as, ascended. He's at the right hand of the Father, and yet there he is in Revelation chapter 1, attending to the needs of 
those seven churches. He's in uh, Revelation chapter 5. He is be before the, th the throne as this one who has been slain, worthy as the lamb, and the sevenfold description of praise to him. In uh, chapter 7 and verse uh, 56 of Acts, as you recall, Stephen, when he is being stoned, looks up into heaven and sees Jesus standing, standing at the right hand of, of the Father. But all of this is the language of, of his throne. So Philippians chapter 2 properly gives us this picture not only of his cross, but his throne. Um, so... Uh, yeah, this notion then of, um, of uh, Jesus ruling and reigning is not uh, to some particularly um, fixed physical location, but it's, um, it, it, that is in terms of the right hand, you know, right hand. See, we think of everything temporally, spatially, what's at my right hand? Of course, that, that right hand is the, the notion of power. It's figurative language for power uh, and authority. So it's not so much physical location as his theological identity. Um, since his ascension to the right hand of the Father, he's enthroned in heaven. And all of this makes sense, believe it or not, when we look at the interpretive key of the whole passage, which is humility. And what does humility mean relative to suffering, relative to Jesus' um, example? Um, and so, uh, however we understand Jesus reigning and his, and his current reign from this throne, it does not conflict with any uh, possible understanding of his return or some future earthly domain, something of that. Um, it's perfectly appropriate to understand Jesus as um, King Jesus in this particular context, um, and even in the present age, this kind of spiritual kingdom over which he uh, presides to govern over his people or his subjects. I think this is, this is much uh, to do with the Sermon on the Mount, or kingdom, kingdom living it has to do with um, how we as his subjects understand the domain in which we're in and the one um, who rules and reigns um, over us. Um, if you recall Jesus when um, questioned by Pilate, uh, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight and prevent, and you remember him saying that. So let's just turn back a little bit to uh, Philippians chapters 1 and 2 and some parts of Philippians that just help us pull out this understanding of uh, beyond belief in terms of suffering, but then a key, a key component there. So uh, I'm certainly not saying that our text indicates um, something uh, by beyond belief that we would say is unbelievable or requires su superior faith to trust in its truthfulness. I'm simply saying that when it comes to living out the Christian life, um, there is more to it than just mere believing to our daily experience of um, following Jesus that, that has to do with, with suffering. It's a refinement of faith. It's a strengthening of faith, a, a, a disciplining of faith that all uh, links to, to suffering. So someone might push back and say, well, well, Doug, okay, but isn't that a rather pessimistic and gloomy outlook for the Christian then when you say that <laughs> what's it, to believe and to suffer? You're going to believe and then you're going to suffer. Welcome to the, to the Christian life. And yet, to, I think to pro properly understand it, um, you know, you have to say, well, well, anything, perhaps everything, everything of value in terms of Christ, your, your growth in Christ, your spiritual development, everything of value comes at a price. Suffering produces so much great and even a greater value than if it was uh, not present at all. How much growth, how much develop would, would, would come if, there, um, if, if life was merely just pleasure? You know, enter the Christian life, place your faith and trust in Jesus, and now the, it's smooth sailing, you know, in this regard. Um, there's absence of problems, all of these kinds of things. So we aren't, again, referencing the fact that there are problems. There is general disappointment, heartache, um, 
health issues, economic issues, all types of, you know, all these things associated with life. In the, but we're talking about a particular kind of suffering that is for a particular purpose and a particular reason. Just because we are believers, the reasoning would be if Jesus suffered for who he is and for who he was during his pilgrimage in this world, if he suffered, then why on earth would we not for the very same reasons and in the very same way. If you need help with that, just go to John chapter 15 and about pick up the reading at about verse 18. You know, and Jesus is going to say, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. If there's, if there's antipathy against Jesus, against God, against Christianity, against the Bible, all of these things, it's generally centered on a basic antipathy for, uh, towards Christ and everything that he stands for. Well, you might say you're, get, you're going all Buddhist, you know, you're going all Buddhist if you're saying that, that there's this whole notion of suffering. And uh, uh, here, here's the thing, you know, so Buddhists will cite what they call dukkha, and they will say, yeah, yeah, there's this general unsatisfactoriness, this general unsettledness uh, that attends life in this world. And you look at the Buddhist wheel, and right at the hub of that, it says that this insatiable desire and craving drives unsatisfactoriness, which then is basically uh, central to life in this world. But what about the solution to that? And so in Buddhism, it's completely the opposite of Christianity. In Buddhism, it's, hey, look, look within yourself. Look within yourself to find the ultimate solution that is beyond all that veil of suffering that's in this, this world. But for the Christian, it's to look beyond yourself and so the response to suffering is to elevate our faith in God and not in oneself. Peter, I think, says this uh, really well in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, where he's talking about the refining of our faith. But I want you to notice um, uh, in verse 6, he says, In all this you greatly rejoice... And beginning at verse 3, he's talking about your salvation. So you're really, really thankful that you are saved, to put it that way. You're, you're delivered from your sins, that this is reserved in heaven for you. But he says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though, 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 now, for a little while, during this brief vapor of a life in this world, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So he's saying not just trials because life is tough. You know, it's disappointing. It's discouraging. There's all these things that happen in this world. But he's talking about trials that are associated with being a follower of Jesus. Peter is saying the same thing as Paul. He's saying there's not only to believe, but there's always also the suffering that goes with that. He's using the word trials, these afflictions, but, it, but you have to look at the verbiage here to suffer grief. That is a specific reference to the affective part of the suffering. In other words, mental anguish. And so he, he's saying though, th this is going to be part and parcel with life in this world is this notion of mental anguish. And again, and again, I, I think would you, would you rather have a broken arm or clinical depression? I think most people would rather have the broken arm, to be honest, than this protracted sense of mental anguish and, and, and torment. Not that he's talking about that here, but I'm just saying that there is a, there is a particular, um, there, there are trials. You see, for example, but what happens if the trial is, is and, and most of this is going to be purely unjust, Things that are out of your control. What if you're living uh, in su some type of circumstance like these, these believers? They're called in verse 1, the, ec the elect of God, but then they're called exiles. Exiles. And do you think there's coming a day where Christians are going to be exiles in this country? You know, like, like just exiles. And, and what is that? Exile. That's that isolation. That's to be isolated, to be marginalized. And he says, so, so the, 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 whatever, whatever the trials are in nature, James goes on to describe a lot of this in James chapter 1, um, but he's saying these are things that cause mental anguish. 
And what does verse 7 say? These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor um, when Jesus Christ is, is revealed. So there's this kind of, of suffering that refines our, our faith. But now, now I just want to narrow, narrow this because that, that's pretty low-hanging fruit, you know, the suffering, and everybody gets it, everybody, everybody knows it, and it's pervasive uh, through the Scripture, but I, I say especially in the New Testament. And we see this highlighted by most of the, of the writers in the New Testament. And so it's this, this idea that, that Paul, Paul, to come back to Philippians 2 and 120, to, 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 to suffer on behalf of Christ, um, this is what? Public, uh, visible, uh, you know, when, when your life is n- not uh, uh, hidden, you know, to, to, the, to those that could potentially push back. When you are living this sort of, a positive life in a negative world, when you are on the offense and not on the defense, and you are, you are out there just shining, you know, that, that light that shines clearly, it's not obscured in any way, and it's out there, then there's going to be this type of, of suffering. You know, as, as Paul told Timothy, they that live godly lives in, in Christ will suffer persecution. I mean, it's all, it's all over Scripture. Um, and Jesus as well. If, if they hated me, they'll, they'll hate you. So we're not, we're not shocked at all by the fact that um, Christians shouldn't be shocked. I mean, they don't have to be happy about it, but, but they shouldn't be shocked that there can be legislation that is specifically designed to curtail religious liberty. You know, where's the shock in that, right? Where's the shock? I mean, we don't like it, and we, we, we feel defenseless, you know, so, sometimes we want to push back. But when we see these things on the horizon, we're just, we're just seeing basic reality between light and darkness. We're seeing an, an increased clarity um, between uh, those that are following Christ and the rest. And there isn't some type of nebulous, uh, you know, uh, murky, foggy middle place. You know, it's, it's, that, that fog is clearing and the, uh, the lines are being drawn as they have multiple times uh, in history. So here Paul, um, for Paul, su- suffering has a response and we might even say a purpose and he's saying to produce humility and in so doing, to accomplish great, neither, either uh, greater or even greater things for the kingdom. And this is what he's trying to say, if we just say, stay within the context of believe and to suffer. And now notice how he just moves now into uh, the therefore in chapter 2 and verse 1, and then into chapter 2, where Jesus now is held up as an example, an example of something uh, for us. If you look at chapter 2 and verse 8, and being found in appearance as a human being, um, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death. But I want, I, I want that phrase, he, he humbled himself. So he was not forced to uh, become obedient, but his humility occasioned his willingness to die this horrific death from which God exalted him to the right hand. So there, there is a, there's a takeaway there. Um, one, you know, a takeaway that God places a value on, on humility, does he not? Such that he exalts the humble and he demotes, even resists the proud. So you see this not just as a fact that, of course, Jesus humbled himself, he's Jesus, but we see it as a value that is consistent with the nature of God and the plan of God. The plan of God. Read the book of Revelation and look at, look at the followers of the Lamb. Look at the army of the Lamb that are absolutely annihilated and slaughtered. And you'd say this is all pure injustice. And you look at the Lamb that was slaughtered. And we'd say that was pure injustice, but the Lamb overcame and the Lamb was victorious, much as those saints in the book of Revelation 
are victorious through death. And it's just not a value that's, that's highlighted in our day. But just brought, more broadly, uh, to, to get a better scope in Scripture, um, just slightly better scope. Proverbs 6, right? Proverbs 6, uh, beginning at verse 16, 16 to 19. These six things the Lord hates, seven are detestable to him. And a ha- haughty eyes, you know, haughty eyes, he, he's talking about this, you know, this proud look, uh, if you will. Luke chapter 14, and this is just what, what comes off the top of the head. You can do much better. Uh, Luke chapter 14 and uh, verse 11, for all those, this is Jesus. And he says, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves, you know, it's humble them, themselves, humble themselves. You know, God humble me. How about you humble yourself, right? Is that what Jesus is saying? <laughs> those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now you have to really pay close attention to this because um, this weighs into a whole bunch of, of imagery between something, uh, you know, exalted or rising up and something being, being brought low. So, for example, in, in Philippians 2.8, he humbled himself. Um, what is it that that means, that Jesus humbled himself? So there's a verb here, and it refers to the act of being low. It's figurative, and it refers to this act of being low or to lower oneself, to make oneself low. So it's just talking about physical prostration. Just lay, lay on the ground. This is figurative language. It means that you, you were in an exalted position, or if, if I think better, you were in a position of advantage. Now, um, choose the place of disadvantage. You have to let that soak in for a while. You're telling an American population, an American population, that you need to think, now that you could just be conditioned, we can, we can all just be conditioned to this place of, I don't want to use the place of privilege, that'll be misunderstood, but advantage, right? So, so there's this sense of advantage. And imagine trying to tell the average American, yeah, yeah you need to, to, to take the position, this very vulnerable position of being um, uh, disadvantaged, right? Disadvantaged. Look at, to, to help flesh this out a little bit, staying in the same book, same author, uh, with slightly different figures of speech. Look at chapter 3, where Paul talks about what he was. He thought he was advantaged as a Pharisee, but then he chose the place that would have disadvantaged him. But then how does he say this? How does he say it? This idea of, and I should say now, um, this is an unforced kind of condition. The verb refers to not that you were forced into being disadvantaged. You were forced. no. This is, you, you chose this. In Philippians 3, 7, what, and, and all the way through this, you know, whatever were gains to me, those I consider loss. So keridos, you know, is this term of, of gain, but it's sort of like loading up a ship, you know, all the, the stuff you put on the ship. But in essence, uh, it's figurative, but not just, not just cargo on a ship, but it's figurative because it's saying, um, these, these were your advantages. Here's this play on words. But what things were an advantage to me, all of my religious acumen by being a Pharisee, all that he describes in those opening verses, but whatever uh, were advantages to me, I now consider them disadvantaged when it comes to what? Christ and, and knowing him. And he's going to go on and and make, make this, I've, I've lost, you see where he says, I consider them garbage. What, what I first considered to be everything were my prize, prizes, now I consider them garbage that I may what now gain, gain the advantage of knowing Christ and being found in him um, and so on. And it's, it's important how, how Paul describes this. So it's not a reference to physical prostration, but it's, it is a reference to attitude. And so Paul is saying, look, look, look. So Jesus on a cross, Jesus with all the mental anguish of dying on that cross, the only reason he was on that cross at all, I mean, what took him there? And Paul is saying, what was the central 
feature of putting him on that cross where he suffered, but what got him there was this central attitude of humility. And he is the ultimate example of someone who had supreme advantage, all the advantages, all the advantages, and left all the advantages of communion with the Father in that heavenly estate to enter um, into this world on our behalf. And so it's a notion of not physical prostration, not of physical posture, if you will, but of, but of attitude. Um, it's basically for us, aligning, humility is aligning our mental attitude and our will, our choices with God's grace. Really, I mean, in fact, I mean, when, when salvation is this free gift and it's the grace of God and we have no, we have, we have nothing, we brought nothing, zero in, into this, then where is the, um, where is there room for the, for the pride or, or for the haughtiness? And you, you see why these are so, so contrary um, to God. So, um, just an example, uh, Matt, look at Matthew uh, 19, and you know it You know it well, but you can go there. Matthew 19, 21 and 22, and this is Jesus with the rich young ruler. Remember, the ruler uh, comes to him, he um, says, what, what must I do to get eternal life? And the ruler says this, he says, uh, so this young fellow, he says, I, I, um, I want this advantage. I want this advantage, right? So, so, so think about it, because he could just as well be talking to an American here. Really, an American who, who basically, we, we're conditioned to think in terms of value in our possessions and what those possessions are worth, and we monetize everything, right? We monetize everything because we're in a, this a capitalistic society where that's how things are done. They're, they're monetized. If you do something, it's monetized. If you have something, it's, it's monetized, right? And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying... That helps you understand where the, where the rich young ruler was, was thinking. He's rich. Number one, he's rich. So, so at the same time, how do you think he's assuming Jesus is going to answer this question? Right? It's going to be what? And so here's just the opposite. Jesus said, well, of course he said, why do you ask me this good? And so on. Or something. It goes through the commandments, right? And so... It's, it's interesting that the uh, rich young ruler describes many of these commandments, but leaves out, you know, you shall not covet, you know, th this kind of thing. Um, but Jesus said, all, all, and he says, all these I've, I've kept, oh, what do I lack? And so, well, go, sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven, and then come follow me. And then the man walks away sorrowful. Why? And so here's this whole notion of the, the, the attitude um, when, when he's faced with a prospect of no longer being advantaged. No longer. So if you want to come into the kingdom, you don't do so seeking to be advantaged in the things of this world or something, but you're willing to, to forfeit that in exchange for, right? So, so um, at the root of this, here's a guy that wants spiritual advantages it really wasn't about his money and getting rid of his money, but it was about what that represented. This was, the, this was not the barrier, his, his money, but it was Jesus exposed this fundamental attitude. And followers of Jesus become disadvantaged in the kingdom of this world so that they might become advantaged um, in the kingdom of heaven. You look at Philippians chapter 2, in case it's, we're questioning the idea of attitude, and that's exactly the term that the apostle uses. So he says, if you want to think properly about Jesus and his whole approach to the cross and what put him on that cross, he says, in your relationships with, with one another, have the same attitude or mind of Christ, the same mindset. Well, sure, there were problems in the church, right? Problems in the church that this attitude would have solved. Look at chapter 4 and verse 7, uh, where he's, uh, well, chapter, um, yeah, sorry, uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same what? Of the same mind in, in the Lord. And he's keeping this same, because, because what? If 
some of us are advantaged and some of us are disadvantaged, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be all these struggles and conflict. But, but if we are all, as Jesus, according to his mindset, the most disadvantaged of the disadvantaged. I mean, he takes the, the form of a servant, it says. He, he takes this as his, using this, this term morphe, to the same sense as he exists as God, but yet he willingly identifies, identifies with this um, role of a, of a servant. And so Paul was just saying that, he's not trying to make a theological point here, he's just saying this attitude should be prevalent in the church among all believers. So we freely accept, we believe, and we, we suffer not just because he did, not just because we're associated with him, because that's what that kind of humility, call it mental prostration, if you will, that kind of being disadvantaged, that kind of being on the losing end, being on the losing end. Imagine saying that to the average American who checks the sports scores every day, right? And rooting for their favorite team because we want to win, we want to win. It's all about wins, wins, wins. Even in business, we say win, how many wins do we get, and so on and so forth. Imagine saying that this was a fundamental attitude of Jesus. Humility, just speaking of it that way, we say, okay, sure, we can be hum hum humble in a relative sense. In a relative sense. It's like being relatively poor. You know, I, I have stuff, but somebody else has more, so I'm poor relative to uh, somebody else. But yet... The poor in spirit that Jesus mentions, this is abject poverty. This is somebody that has nothing. And when he mentions humility here, it's to be completely disadvantaged. I mean, later on, uh, in, in, uh, you know, Peter is going to write that as a lamb was led to the slaughter, so he opened not his mouth. Where is Jesus' defense in going to the cross? And we can revisit all those passages. Where is his attorney? Where is his representation? For all of the falsified evidence that comes in, where is his? None. He offers, he offers none. Uh, so, uh, let's, just, let's just take a, a quick rundown of um, what exactly um, went into Jesus' disadvantaged state. So he, he's stripped naked, he's hung on a cross as some vile public offender. Uh, he's uh, paraded through the streets with someone walking out in front with a little placard in three languages, you know, it says he's the king of the Jews. So he's guilty of sedition. He's brought before uh, prejudiced jurors with falsified evidence. He's betrayed by one of his own, Judas. So we're thinking... How, does, how, how is any of this relevant to us? Or do we just say, well, that was Jesus. That was Jesus, but, but not us. None of this applies to us. We'll never be falsely accused. You know? So, so he, I mean, he's God. He's, he's God. And yet he willingly hangs on that, on that cross when, when how many legions of angels were standing at the ready, ready to brandish their swords, just say the word, and we'll, we'll get you off that cross. But he hangs there, right? He hangs there as the most, uh, it, as far as the world is concerned, he's defeated, absolutely defeated and, and powerless, the most victorious and the most powerful. Um, he enters this, this sin-saturated world as the son of God. All, all of these things, you, you ha just have to think. The son of God now associates himself with with this sin-sick world and sinful humanity takes on human nature, takes on human likeness, only to experience, and, and people would say, wouldn't it just be great to be Jesus, right? Just great to be Jesus. I can be, I can be Jesus, and I can, I can uh, calm the storm, and I can walk on water. And yet think, this is an unbounded deity, unbounded by time, space, and matter that now localizes himself and submits to all of these limitations and needs and, and all such uh, conditions of this world. Um, he leaves the eternal bliss of his heavenly father. 
Um, he, he, knowing that, now look, knowing he would be a sacrifice for all, and at the same time, knowing he would be rejected. Do you think more have rejected him than accepted him? This is just incredible, you know? So, so you know, even for just a few, he's willing to die, willing to come and pay that price. He created the universe, put people in it, and gave them the ability to choose not to obey him. And so in exchange for the favor of existence, right? Unless you're going to say, oh, well, I exist here in this world, and I guess I'm stuck with it just because here I am. But if you're saying you value life and it's your most precious possession is not what you own, but the very life you have and the, the breath that you have to draw, and yet at the same time capable of not returning worship back to the one who gave you that life. But in fact, if it were just that, if it were just that alone, that I've, God, I've created you, I've put you in this, in this world, but you don't worship me. But it's worse than that, because not only not worshiping, we rebelled against him. And we rebelled in the most horrific way because we listened to the voice. We didn't listen to his voice, the one who created us, the one who, who put us in this kind of perfect Edenic world. And instead, we listened to the voice of the arch enemy. You know, we, we, we listened to this voice and run after him. I can only think why God doesn't just summarily wipe them out. This <laughs> is to wipe them out. Uh, completely. And here's this God after, after the first page of, of Genesis, the creator turns redeemer. Why do you keep pursuing page after page after page, rebellion after rebellion after rebellion, and still pursuing, pursuing, pursuing? So in the case of Jesus, you'd say half of this is his suffering on the cross and the rest of it is what? Devoted to his exaltation. And so the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to compare, be compared with the glory that, that follows. This is 8.18 of, of Romans. This is what Paul says in the, minutes, in the middle of Romans 8 when he starts talking about the groaning and travail of all creation and the sin-sick world. But beyond that, Beyond that comes the revelation of the sons of God in a new day. So how do we get there? And Paul would say, the same writer would say, it's the path of humility. It's the path of living in a world uh, being completely disadvantaged. Until you see, you see those saints in Revelation that couldn't be any more disadvantaged. Everything is stacked against it. We, we, listen, we have been blessed in a nation, in a nation founded on godly principles and freedoms guaranteed by our founding instruments. We, we have been blessed by that. Other believers in other nations have not been blessed by that. They know what it is to be disadvantaged. They know that. They know what it is to have the deck stacked completely against them with a government that, that makes it illegal Illegal to even speak the name of, of Jesus. Illegal to, to meet as believers. It, illegal to, to read the Bible or disseminate it. And I've been to many of these lands. And yet here, it's a tough pill to swallow. As we watch our freedoms one by one. What? What? Going? going. We say, wait, wait, wait. That's not, that's not fair. You can't do that. Yes, they can. And yes, they will. <laughs> they will. They will. Unless God intervenes somewhere and the people of God's hearts are turned back to him. But I tell you, you can't go decade after decade after decade after decade after decade. The present situation we find ourselves in, we are not there by accident. This did not happen overnight. But yet we find ourselves as believers in a world that is, in a nation that is little by little, little by little, much more is there than we've seen, are able to see now. 
Little by little, the deck is being stacked, right? And Paul would just say, well, you're just going to now become aligned with the first century. Welcome to the first century, he's going to say. Welcome to the first century. Um, You look at Ephesians chapter 4. What does ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? I just want to throw throw this in because um, you have this whole motif of ascended descent. And regardless of the theological um, questions that might be there in all of that, you see where he was in a position of, of advantage and descended the lower earthly regions, you know, in his incarnation. Here is this lower earthly region, this, this ascent uh, and, and descent. Um, this, is, this is what Jesus has, in fact, um, done himself. And you say, well, what does that have to do with us? If you look at chapter 4 and verse 1 of Ephesians, as a prisoner, same author, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then, oh, shock of shock, how did we do there? Be completely humble and gentle. So this is his example. And this is, this is who we are, but um, Jesus had a crown after the cross, and we are in a similar situation. That regardless of where we live in this world, and what generation, and what time frame, we're called to believe and to suffer, but it has a terminal point. Our lives don't last forever in this, in this world. And suffering, whatever it might dish out, we take a humble approach, even if it is the, the sense of disadvantage. Disadvantage. It isn't to say you don't, you don't speak up for yourself. It isn't to say you don't um, uh, try to defend your rights and so on and so forth. But there's going to come a day when those rights are not going to be there. There's going to be nothing to assert in a court of law because those laws are going to be off the books. Is, does anybody dispute this? I mean, it, really, as you, see, as you see things, and we don't even have to see things in our own nation, we just have to look at other nations and see how other societies have framed um, their laws uh, in, in a sense to not just curtail, but to completely demolish if it was possible. It's a, a Christianity, and we've seen this. We've seen this. Just, just, go, just go back a century. Go back two centuries and see the shift shift from Christianity, whether it's from um, North America and Europe, the strongholds, right? Now where is it? The global south and the global east. And these shifts come, right? So we're, we're, we're seeing this again and again and again. So our encouragement is, um, is that it's bounded by this life only and that we have an eternity to spend with our Savior. Lord, thank you for this time that you've given to us. Thank you for a brief look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, or part of it. Uh, Bless us, Lord, as we um, continue to live and to walk. um, As as things outside of us change, nothing changes uh, inside of us. Nothing can affect our salvation. Uh, It can affect our, our peace at times but cannot affect our salvation. And Lord, help us to live this out even in difficult times. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.